Thank you very much for having me. Um, so I was asked to give some reflections about uh, the two different paradigms that I've studied from. And so my talk today is going to be somewhat more of a discussional narrative rather than a deep academic paper. Uh, I'll begin with an anecdote. My master's dissertation at the University of Medina uh, was entitled uh, in Arabic, obviously, Jahan ibn Safwan uh, and his effects on the theological uh, groups. And it was an 800 page uh, dissertation in Arabic that was uh, uh, awarded the highest honors. And I felt after four years of research uh, in Medina uh, about Jahan ibn Safwan, surely nobody in the world would know more than I did about Jahan ibn Safwan. And so I, uh, as soon as I arrived at Yale University, the first thing that I did the first week is I walked into Sterling Library and I researched who else had written about Jaham in the Western tradition. Uh, and I came across an article written by Richard M. Frank before I was born actually, uh, entitled The Neoplatonism of Jaham Ibn Safwan. And I rushed eagerly to uh, uh, go and read the article on the sixth floor where the Arabic uh, selections were. And I remember I read that article and I reread it and I reread it three times. I read it and it was my one of my first exposures to the two different worlds that uh, we are now discussing today. Uh, the article of Richard M. Frank hardly referenced most of the material that I had uh, put in my dissertation. It really seemed to ignore many of the sources that uh, I was using. And yet what he was talking about really seemed completely foreign to my entire dissertation. Fact of the matter is, and I don't mind confessing this at the time, this was almost 20 years ago, I really didn't understand uh, Richard M. Frank's article or his thesis or the entire, like the, the, the point of the, 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 the article itself. I had never studied Neoplatonism in Medina and I didn't quite grasp uh, what he was trying to convey. So uh, the talk that I wanted to begin with this anecdote because to me, it really, it, it really illustrates that the two paradigms are operating from, at times, such different uh, uh, presumptions and such different worldviews. And uh, I want to, of course, begin with the disclaimer that much of what I'm saying is anecdotal, and therefore there must always be exceptions to the rule. And also things have changed. I mean, uh, I, I studied in Medina in the 90s, and I got accepted at Yale in the early 2000s. And so I'm sure much has changed. There were not that many uh, Muslims in the academy back then, but I think that itself is changing. And along with that, more madrasa students are coming. So much of my talk might be uh, hopefully outdated. I do hope so. But I'll begin with the most obvious paradigmatic difference. And then I'll mention three positives of the madrasa and then three positives of the academy and then mention some concluding thoughts. The obvious paradigmatic difference is that religious seminaries are faith-based, whereas the academic study of Islam isn't. And of course, this need, leads to an entirely different worldview. There are clear red lines that each of the two disciplines will not cross. And there are a set of, of, of assumptions that are tacit amongst both. Seminaries begin with the basic presumption in the truthfulness of the faith that they study. And the fact that this is a genuine path to come closer to God. Hence, the type of students that are attracted to seminaries are generally speaking, religiously motivated individuals who wish to live a better life, a morally superior life, a spiritually uh, fulfilled life by drawing closer to God. Because of this, obviously, there is an extremely high reverence for uh, what is perceived to be the revelation of God, the Quran, uh, the persona of the prophet, uh, the, the teachings of the prophet. And of course, it will be anathema to, to challenge any of that from within the uh, madrasa system. Uh, not just that, not just the Quran and the traditions of the Prophet, every single seminary in the world, every single seminary is coming from a particular paradigm from within the faith. And the goal of that seminary is to therefore produce uh, uh, um, intellectuals or to produce researchers or to produce religious clerics that will further convey and support that particular understanding of Islam. And so if I talk about the University of Medina, it is understood by uh, when I was studying there, I don't know what has happened since then, I think changes are going on, but when I was studying there in the 90s, uh, it was understood and it was quite clear that you needed to subscribe to the theological underpinnings of that uh, entire system, which of course means uh, the doctrines of Ibn Taymiyyah, of Muhammad al Wahhab, of the overall, you know, Salafi paradigm. And I remember clearly that uh, a student was actually expelled uh, when it was discovered that he was a maturidi and that he wasn't sympathetic to, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Athari uh, paradigm. Uh, and the goal, of course, is, is quite clear that 
the seminary wants to produce religious leadership that embodies its values and that exudes its version of orthopraxy and orthodoxy. And it will only achieve that goal by having this type of, 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 of mindset. The academy, on the other hand, has no such pretensions about itself. It has no concern regarding your personal beliefs or your commitment or lack thereof to any faith. Rather, it aims to produce what it views are unbiased researchers. Hence, there is no claim of reverence for the text or the subject studied. And generally speaking, one is much more freer to posit uh, a wide variety of questions in a very different genre compared to the madrasa. The academy as an unspoken rule shies away from asking questions that are deemed to be beyond the scope of study. Does God exist? Has he actually sent an Arabian prophet? Is the Quran a divine revelation? These are questions that are viewed to be questions of faith, not academic research and hence not in the purview of the academy. One small point though can be pushed back here and that is that while the assertion might be true that the academy never discusses this explicitly, uh, one must wonder the underlying presumptions uh, that exist in the mind of the researchers as they talk about uh, Near Eastern legends and Quranic passages and how much you know, overlap there is. Uh, the, the, the underlying notions of human influence and the sources of Quranic authorship are quite clearly being indicated, even if they're not generally expressed in such explicit terms. So this is the obvious paradigmatic difference between the madrasa and the academy. Three strengths of the madrasa system that I personally um, uh, think are uh, definitely some of the strengths that we need to think about. Number one, the encyclopedic in-depth study that any madrasa training will give you. And it is both encyclopedic in its scope and in depth in the covering of the material. You cannot graduate from any reputable madrasa without studying each and every discipline of the Islamic sciences to a level of familiarity that would allow you to read further on your own. Typically, you would even specialize in at least one or two uh, sub-disciplines. In my time in the University of Medina, uh, before they made changes, again, I got the old curriculum. Thank God for that. I didn't get the modern curriculum. Uh, I got the old curriculum that was based in the 70s, um, and I was the last batch to get that. We took the equivalent of 25 credit hours every single semester for four years. We typically had between 13 to 15 different professors every semester to juggle at any given time. And even though my college at the undergraduate level was the College of Hadith, just because I studied Hadith, it had very little impact on 60% of the curriculum, which was across all colleges. We studied Arabic grammar, we studied the Al-Fiyat Ibn Malik cover to cover, we studied Sarf, we studied the science of Tafsir, of theology. Uh, I graduated from Hadith, and yet I had probably just as many hours in Fiqh uh, as the College of Sharia did as well. And we studied these books cover to cover, which is another positive of the madrasa. We actually read source books in Arabic written a thousand or 800 years ago, and we went over them line by line in class to understand that particular science through the lens of a reputable authority. And I must say with pride that I still have all of my uh, worn out books, um, you know, much annotated and, you know, pages missing and whatnot, you know, from that, uh, from that period. There is simply no equivalent of this training uh, that any modern academic institution offers. It is neither the goal of the academy, nor is it even feasible. Hence, it is extremely rare to find the breadth of understanding of all of the major sciences of Islam that one finds in a madrasa graduate. And because of this, it is far easier for a researcher in the academy to make a, a very simple uh, mistake, uh, an egregious mistake, if they go beyond their particular area of expertise. The second strength of the madrasa system is the memorization of source material and much of the primary source data. The madrasa student is expected to know the material, at least the basics of it, really from the top of his head without opening up any books. Quotations from the Quran definitely do not need to be looked up because the norm is to be a half uh, of the entire Quran. Traditions of the Prophet that deal with your discipline uh, are expected to be memorized in the original and you should know, you know where the sources are. The opinions of the legal schools and the famous scholars, they should be known to you uh, at the tips of your finger without even looking them up. And I remember last week, actually, I was discussing with them a researcher, a modern academic researcher in the Qiraat, and I kind of like, you know, expressed, I, I, I felt sorry for him that he had to look up every single verse 
and al jazali and al dani and what the authors say uh, about the 10 qiraat because i know for a fact my colleagues in the college of quran uh, would know the 10 qiraat from the top of their head uh, and they've memorized the shatibiyah and the durra uh, and so the notion of of knowing your material and and having it you know uh, memorized is something that the madrasa emphasizes I think it was self-evident, is the level uh, of grasp of the Arabic language. I myself am not an Arab, eth uh, 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 ethnically speaking. I had to learn Arabic. But obviously, you cannot go to a madrasa without mastering uh, the, the, the language to a level that uh, I was actually um, uh, shocked to discover it doesn't exist anywhere near uh, as much as it should in the in the Western Academy. Uh, an anecdote that I'll never forget, um, and I won't mention the professor's name, but he is a world-renowned professor, world-renowned. Um, we were sitting in class, and uh, a passage comes, and he's reading uh, the passage, and uh, uh, there's a phrase in it, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. And of course, even a child would know this is Ayat al-Kursi, and how to translate it. But this particular professor um, uh, read it, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. And he translated it that neither does any habitual habit overtake God, nor does God go to sleep. And I said, uh, Professor, no, actually it's sina, which means to fall asleep or to be sleepy or whatnot. But it, it, to, to me, it was just um, shocking, to be honest, that such a world-renowned person does, is not even aware of the primary text and makes an error that would frankly be unforgivable uh, at an even uh, undergraduate level, but it is what it is. The level of Arabic and familiarity of Arabic is obviously very different um, in, in the Western Academy. So these are the three strengths that I, I feel every madrasa student uh, would be able to exemplify. When you look at the Academy, the Academy definitely has its strengths as well. Strength number one, bringing in the political and social factors and the overall, uh, the context of the individuals that you're studying, situating the author in a greater narrative, linking the author to factors that might be relevant to uh, understanding the text uh, or even the, the oeuvre or, uh, or even the theology. I mean, um, Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, there's a, common, there's a common notion there that a number of people have expressed that the, it was the invasion of the Mongols and the uh, the the uh, impeding defeat and the the fact that uh, the the Muslims felt under attack that somewhat caused Ibn Taymiyyah to become the figure that he was and to if you like take that anger out or, or maybe a better term would be to defend the faith against other sects and and what he believed to be heresies but of course you know with that also comes the caveat that how much psychoanalysis are we doing of our medieval authors based upon our understandings, our biases and inclinations? Maybe how we would have reacted in particular contexts is not necessarily how they would have reacted, but nonetheless, it is a strength to bring in the political and social context. I remember, again, when I first got accepted, um, reading a paper with the, with the title, uh, A Mamluk Theologian's Response to Avicenna, meaning Ibn Taymiyyah's response. And I thought to myself at the time, who cares if he's under the Mamluks? I mean, why would you refer to Ibn Taymiyyah as a Mamluk theologian? And again, that's a, a mindset difference where we're looking at the, because in, in, in Medina, frankly, we had never ever, it was never a factor. What era was he living in? You know, who was he living under? What were the things going on at the time? You look at the author and his book as if it's independent of anything going on. And I think that is definitely not um, a, a very um, a, a nice thing to do or a very positive thing to do. The Western Academy situates the author and the political and social circumstances, which is very relevant. But again, with the caveat, how relevant is something uh, every person has to decide. A second strength of the Academy is the emphasis on cross-cultural and multilingual references. Uh, and I personally greatly appreciated this when I began my studies at Yale. So for example, for Richard M. Frank to bring in the Neoplatonic influence on Jahab ibn Safwan, I mean, again, most madrasas, uh, and I know for a fact Medina is definitely like this, they're going to begin with the Arabic and end with the Arabic. And they're going to begin with Islamic civilization and end with Islamic civilization. Even at the graduate level, there is no concern, there is no care to worry about, you know, pre-Islam and Neoplatonic thought uh, and source material in, in Arabic, I mean, in, sorry, in, uh, in Latin or Greek or, or Hebrew, anything of this nature. You will concentrate on one culture, that's the Arab culture, on one era, that is Islamic era, and the rest of it is really not uh, relevant. Of course, the academy will not allow you to do that. And you are expected to be aware uh, of uh, 
uh, uh, different, you know, civilizational impacts on Islam, uh, different understandings of the same idea in, in different regions. And also uh, to add to this as well, the academy emphasizes secondary source material, whereas the madrasa emphasizes primary source material. And so in the madrasa, we study as suyuti we study Ibn Taymiyyah, we study an nawawi we study these authors who are, you know, the, the, the movers and shakers of whatever tradition they're doing. And frankly, there's not much concern about um, the rest of the, uh, how modern authors have interpreted a Nawi, for example. Of course, in the academy, if you write anything, you must demonstrate that you are aware of how other people have interpreted your subject and your figure. And what that does, and it's helped me do as well, is to help shape my own worldviews by understanding how others have viewed the same matter. And so I think this is definitely a great positive of the academy as well. A third positive of the academy is obviously source criticism. We in Medina would approach the texts, even if they're not divine. We know Suyuti is not divine. We studied his book cover to cover, line by line. I mean here, of course, his book on Mustalah of Hadith. Uh, we know uh, Al-Iraqi is not divine. He wrote Al-Fiyat ibn Malik and the Sharah, of, sorry, of it. Uh, we know he's not divine. And yet we will approach it with a, a sense of reverence that, okay, this is the this is the, 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 the subject's master. And who are we and except minor disciples? So who are we to question the master? So there's a, a very, very marked level of reverence to the text that we study, even that, as we acknowledge that you know, the, 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 the authors that we're studying are not divinely inspired. Obviously, that is completely thrown out the window in the academy, perhaps too much so, but it is completely irrelevant who the author is uh, because you're looking at uh, ideas and not personas. And so there's a much higher level of source criticism, being far more skeptical of something just because uh, someone says it. And again, I remember this to my own, uh, my own personal anecdote here in uh, my first paper that I wrote at Yale. Um, it was about uh, the alleged Mu'tazidism of Hassan al-Basri, right? And, uh, you know, as you're probably aware, if you study your theology issues in this regard, that the notion is Hassan al-Basri, there was a notion, now it's been kind of debunked uh, by modern researchers, but there was a notion Hassan al-Basri was perhaps a neo-Mu'tazilite. And of course, internally, I was fuming. My God, how can they possibly say this, right? This is my first year at Yale, obviously, so cut me some slack there. So I wrote an entire, you know, 20-page paper. Uh, and, uh, you know, my professor at the time, great friend of mine, Frank Griffel, he simply quickly goes over it and he goes, this entire paper is frankly worthless. I said, what do you mean? Why? He goes, all of your references are eighth century Sunni scholars, seventh century Sunni scholars. Of course, they're going to back project their ideas onto Hassan al-Basri. You know, I, I thought I wrote a very good paper, very erudite paper. His basic point was, which is, of course, a valid, your sources. How can you trust sources written 500, 600, 800 years after and not really go back to at least contemporaries or whatever else we can do? And of course, this caused me to think and, and research and uh, the whole notion of source criticism, being more skeptical uh, of, 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 of the material that you read. Uh, of course, there's a healthy dosage of that in the Western Academy. So these are three positives of both the Western Academy and the Madrasa. Before I, I finish off and conclude, I want to mention the elephant in the room. Uh, which really does need to be addressed head on. And that is the mutual suspicion that exists from each side against the other. The fact of the matter is that from the seminarian side, from the, uh, from the madrasa side, there is really an almost hostile view of the academy. Most students in madrasas, dare I say most Muslims around the globe, they find it, and I'm just telling you as it is, I mean, I'm, I'm not endorsing, I'm just telling you as it is, they find it incomprehensible that someone can master the Arabic language and study the faith and read the Quran in the original and read the life of the prophet in such an intensive manner without seeing the veracity of the faith that they're studying, without embracing the faith. I still get asked to this day, is that your professors actually knew all this and they learn Arabic and they're not Muslim? This is a, 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 a type of, of presumption that most students in madrasas would have that it, it boggles their mind. Why would these people want to study a faith that they don't believe in and study it in such an intimate manner and yet still not be personally committed to it? And the fact that there have, they haven't embraced the faith in the eyes of these madrasa students, frankly, many Muslims, it automatically implies, therefore, that they must have recognized the truth and willfully and arrogantly rejected it. That being the case in their eyes, 
The only option to conclude is that they must have an evil or sinister agenda. And that agenda is to create doubts and to spread the seeds of corruption, shubuhats is the Arabic term, uh, in the minds of the uh, Muslims. Now, uh, to be fair, the academy also has to own up historically to its own roots and to the linkage of uh, proselytizing Christian missionaries or even um, uh, the, uh, colonialist movements or even in our times, the neocons. So uh, to be fair, there are certain segments of the academy that uh, other segments have to dissociate from. But still, um, in the eyes of many conservative Muslims or many madrasa students, all that one needs to do in the mainstream Muslim circles to discredit a work or an idea or an author is to simply point out that it comes and originates from the academy. You know, one of the cheapest ad hominems constantly employed against me by my critics is the fact that they say my faith has been corrupted uh, because I've been to Yale. That's it. If, if they don't agree with something I say, all they need to do without engaging the idea, without critiquing what I've said, is to simply say, oh, well, you know, Yale corrupted him. That's it, QED, uh, you know, end of story. And so there is this notion, there, and the reason why it's effective is really because it is inconceivable for many, many Muslims to actually believe there might be researchers who are not spiritually committed, nor are they arrogant, they just want to research the faith. It's not, it's not something they quite understand. And so because of this, it is easy to dismiss anything that comes out of the, of the academy that is not uh, from within our own tradition. Now, that having been said, I have to also be honest and point out the flip side. It's a two-way street here. It is all too common for research that is done by a Muslim academic who happens to be a faithful Muslim a research that might overall be in line with, let's say, mainstream values or mainstream understanding, but simply because it is done by uh, a Muslim, it might be dismissed as apologetics, as not worthy of genuine respect. And I remember I studied also with the great M.M. Azami, um, the one who wrote studies in early Hadith literature back in the 60s, his PhD from Cambridge. And I remember he remarked uh, uh, this as well, is that um, uh, he felt that his research was not given the respect that he felt this way, I, that it was not given the respect that it, that it was due, even though he was academic throughout his dissertation, but it was just dismissed as apologetics, as, oh, he's simply proving that, you know, hadith has been preserved. Now, when Motsky comes along and does something similar, even though in a very different manner, it is given far more credit. And to this day, M.M. Azami's work is really not considered to be uh, a, a, a mainstream reference, even though it is a scholarly work. Obviously, I don't agree with everything, but it is uh, an interesting work here. But I have to say that I have faced this sentiment in the academy, right? And because I'm a cleric and I'm a preacher, and because it's obvious that I am you know, a faith-based Muslim, um, it, is, it is quite easy for people in the academy to dismiss much of what I do or say and point out that, oh, well, he's basically a, a faith-based cleric. And I have heard such sentiments multiple times in the last uh, 20 years. And frankly, uh, on a personal note, it's also one of the reasons why I've really decided to spend more time in, in a seminary environment rather than the academy, because I felt it wasn't really conducive um, uh, to, to a long-term goal. But anyway, that's my personal, um, uh, that's my personal uh, belief. Uh, before I finish off, I want to finish off the anecdote. Uh, of Richard M. Frank and his Neoplatonism article. So uh, one of my last weeks at Yale, I decided, you know what, let me, let me reread that article that I had read when I was accepted so many years ago. I was at Yale for eight years. Uh, and so on a whim, I decided to go read the article Neoplatonism one more time. And I was pleasantly surprised to find that I, I, was, I was enjoying reading the article I understood everything Richard M. Frank was saying at this time. I actually appreciated uh, where he was coming from. And at the same time, I felt that there were many other things that he left out that could have been added. He was being simplistic at various places. But overall, I, I, I agreed with, uh, with his thesis. And actually, my dissertation at Yale incorporates some of those I as ideas in chapter one and, and develops upon them. And so I've always wanted to um, go back to the topic of Jahan bin Safwan and write an article entitled The Neoplatonism of Jahan bin Safwan, Part 2, by Yasser Qadi. And maybe one day I'll do that. And with that, I hand the uh, mic back to the host. And thank you once again for having me.